Welcome to this session. Um, my name is Martin Booth. I'm a technical product manager at Microsoft based out of Redmond. Uh, and I'm responsible for uh, client management and device management solutions from a technical marketing perspective. I've got my colleague, Craig, here. Do you want to yep. introduce yourself? I can introduce my, uh, Craig Morris. I'm a senior program manager with the engineering team, so somewhat responsible for the product you're going to see today. So. so I'll give you the marketing bit. Craig will give you the uh, actual proper technical details. <laughs> Um, so this session is about uh, device management, and we figured for this session we'd try to go for the uh, longest possible title we could actually fit on the slide. So uh, welcome to Unified Modern Device Management with Microsoft System Center 2012 Configuration Manager SP1 integrated with Windows Intune. I, I and breathe. Did, oh, I, and by I, the way, the reason we're standing over here is because we stand here, it's very squeaky. So we'll be standing on the sides of the, of the stage, so so as not to distract you too much. Too much. We're distracting enough as it is. OK, so I'm going to go through um, an overview of mobile device management and the Microsoft take on it, what we mean by people-centric IT. Um, and then I'm going to take you through device enrollment, some of the technical details around it and what the end user experience is to get devices enrolled in the environment. I'm then going to hand over to Craig. And you're going to take us through? And I'm going to talk about device inventory, so some of the changes we've made with regards to actually doing inventory on these mobile devices. Following that, we'll talk about some settings management, the types of settings that we're able to set. We've actually also talk about some of the new things we're actually bringing along with the next release, which will be the R2 release uh, coming out this year. And then I'll finally hand off to Martin to, to wrap it up. Yep, and I'll take you through uh, some of the data protection things that we look at, what we can do to safeguard against devices that get lost or are no longer used or if people uh, leave the company there. So that's kind of the outline of where we're going to go with this and, and how we're going to structure this session. Um, before I actually delve into the details, though, I've um, got a few little arm-raising exercises for you guys just so we can uh, gauge where people are. How many people went to the People-Centric IT Foundation session on Monday? A good number, good. How many people went to the Configuration Manager Overview? Ooh, lots. Excellent. And, and how many people have been to one of the other device management sessions so far around Configuration Manager? OK, great. So our session's kind of like, I think, three, number three in a number series, two. really? We're number two. There's another one this afternoon. And there's one more this afternoon, which yeah. will delve into the application side, uh, application management for mobile devices and for uh, your PC clients as well. So we'll take you through the actual kind of nuts and bolts of what it means to do uh, device management here. So for those of you that have seen these slides already, my apologies, but uh, I'll just whip through this for people that haven't seen it already. Um, at Microsoft, our approach to uh, client management is really going it, to, it's now focused around the users. Uh, for a long time, the idea of managing a PC uh, was very focused on the PC. We'll help you get a, an image for your PC, a very specific static image that you'd push out to uh, all your PCs, and all your users would get exactly the same thing, and they'd learn to love it and live with it. Um, what we're finding more and more is that users, they, they want to do their job, but they want to do it in the way that suits them in the way that kind of meets their needs. So working from various locations, various styles of work, um, customizing and personalizing their environment. We're also seeing a huge number of devices coming into the enterprise now. I'm sure many of you have had people walk in with the latest, greatest phone or tablet and want to actually connect it up to the corporate network, get some corporate apps on it, get access to email, the intranet sites, and things like that. So we have this huge explosion of devices out that are are out there that want to come inside the corporate network. The third kind of thing we look at is around the apps themselves. Um, we have a lot of apps out there, um, but we want to see how we can enable them across all the platforms. Because we have this variety of device types, we want to make sure that we're providing capabilities for people to do work whatever their device type. And then, of course, the data. I mean, this is the key one when it comes to enterprise security and compliance is how do we actually manage that data? How do we make sure the devices that the data lands on uh, are compliant with our policy needs? And what happens in the event of an emergency when a device is lost or stolen or someone gets booted out of the company? So those are kind of the, the four areas we look at, but it really does start at the heart with the user. So looking at those four, underneath we want to provide good management, we want to provide reliable, flexible access mechanisms, and we want to provide that corporate data protection side. So enabling your end users, giving them the tools they need, 
making sure we have a, a good unified management environment that's going to be scalable, flexible, consistent, simple to use, and then the data protection side. So that's kind of the overview of people-centric IT um, and why we see we need to deliver these things, but keeping the user at the heart of what we do there. So we have a uh, system center configuration manager, and you've heard lots about it this week, I'm sure. Uh, we announced the R2 release, System Center 2012 R2 configuration manager. Because this P1 just wasn't long enough, so we had to make yeah, it happen. Yeah, we're getting very creative <laughs> with the naming, numbers appearing in different places. Um, we have unified device management with configuration manager when you hook it up to Windows Intune. And that's what we're really going to be talking about during the course of this presentation. Intune itself can be used in a standalone mode where you get a, a simple web console to enable you quick and easy administration of devices that are out in the cloud, so our cloud-based management solution. For some customers, that provides what they need. It's simple, it, it's got a great policy set, um, and it provides a, a very good solution for small, mid-market customers. Um, if you're going to scale, though, or if you want to do depth policy management, or if you want to get all the bells and whistles that an IT pro is used to uh, in a, a management environment, Configuration Manager hooked up to Intune is, is the way to go there. So the features that we look at delivering, um, we started this with uh, System Center 2012 Configuration Manager Service Pack 1 in December, where we uh, released the Windows Intune connector the ability to take Configuration Manager and hook it up to the cloud management service. And the main areas we look to provide there, over-the-air enrollment, so this is the piece I'm going to come on to demo in a minute, the ability for the user to make their device part of the corporate management environment, the user targeting of app deployment and uh, user and device settings management, so making sure that apps can get to the device and that devices are compliant, and then you've got the inventory and the ability to retire and wipe devices. So we brought all those capabilities in with Service Pack 1 and Windows Intune uh, back in December, and we're really looking to build on those as we move forward with the R2 release and the release of Windows Intune that's going to be coming later this year. So just kind of a, a architecture diagram of how this looks. Um, we have our IT Pro on the left-hand side. Again, when we're talking about people-centric IT, it's not just about the end user as the person. It's about the IT Pro. We need to make sure that we're providing a good... Uh, IT Pro-centric environment as well. And what we want to give the IT Pro is a single console, a single pane of glass for managing the environment, whether it's uh, the PCs or the Macs in the on-premise network, uh, or even Linux servers, Windows servers, as applicable. That's the traditional configuration manager environment. We also want to reach out through the Windows Intune services to the mobile devices. And you can see there the platforms we support. We have Windows RT and Windows Phone, of course. Uh, we also have support for iOS and Android devices uh, in the device management there. One of the ways I like to kind of think about this, um, particularly with customers who are very familiar with Configuration Manager, is that Windows Intune, the cloud services there, effectively act as a management point and distribution point for Configuration Manager. So the main Configuration Manager site has its connector role that talks out to the cloud services to put the settings and the applications that are going to be deployed to the devices up into the cloud where they're staged ready for the devices to connect to those cloud services. So it's a very simple enhancement to your existing configuration in manager environment, just to kind of add the cloud piece in there. So with Configuration Manager R2, there's a few new things we bring in terms of the platforms that we support. Um, they're highlighted in that kind of ready orange color on the slide here. Um, at the top, of course, Windows 8.1 PCs. Um, you'll have heard in the keynote that uh, the Windows team announced open mobile device management capabilities for Windows 8.1. That means that we now actually have a choice. We can actually manage Windows 8.1 PCs as a traditional PC here, uh, using the full config manager agent and doing the deep on-premise style management or we could actually manage them as a mobile device. So maybe these devices are home laptops that people are using or their own desktop PC at home. You want to do a level of management, but you don't ha necessarily have full control of it because it's the user's own personal device, the whole bring your own device scenario there. So we have that with Windows 8.1, the ability to manage deeply using Configuration Manager or do the mobile uh, device management through the OMADM agent. Under the end user experience on the right-hand side, it also calls out what the uh, self-service experience is for getting applications. So we have the app catalog in Configuration Manager, or we can use the company portal app. 
Um, in the keynote, Molly Brown did the, the demo of the company portal, where you've got a nice modern app style interface to go and do self-service. And that'll, they'll go into great detail into that on uh, this afternoon session as well. So. Yes, that's a good point. Um, moving further down the slide in the management agent column, you'll also see that Android is highlighted uh, with the orangey red color. Currently, with Service Pack 1 and the, the current release of Windows Intune, uh, we do management of Android via Exchange Active Sync policy. So we have the Exchange connector that allows policy to flow through to, from Configuration Manager to Exchange to get down to the Android devices. With the R2 release, we are actually going to have a full-on management agent that you'll put on your Android devices that uh, give a deeper level of management and, and better reporting and compliance information coming back from the device. So uh, that's going to be coming later this year. And again, for uh, the self-service experience, the company portal apps are going to be available uh, for iOS and for Android. And as Craig mentioned, the session this afternoon later on uh, on app deployment will cover more about those. So one thing I just wanted to kind of call out, because I've had a lot of conversations with customers this week um, where there's been some confusion, misunderstanding, or uh, our clarity has not been perhaps as good as it could be uh, about the concept of registering a device and workplace join that we now have in Windows 8.1 and enrolling a device for management. So I just wanted to uh, spend a few minutes kind of describing the differences between workplace join and enrollment. We have a, a user with his devices that he wants to bring into his environment. Uh, this was the demo that Molly did where she tried to access a SharePoint site and she initially got uh, access denied. Uh, Molly then went to register her device through Workplace Join. Uh, when she did that, she got uh, prompted for a second factor of authentication, and in that case, we used Foam Factor to do that. And then she was allowed through to the SharePoint side. So if I just kind of build out the bottom half of this slide, um, that's built on top of our web application proxy technology and using uh, the Active Directory. So when you register a device, an object's created in AD, a certificate's provisioned back to the device, we can then authenticate the device as it's coming into the network via the web app proxy. So the registration is really about authenticating that access in. Enrolling for management, which was the second piece that Molly did, um, is where we take the device and we opt in and say, OK, I'm going to allow my device to be managed. So we enroll it through Intune, and we use Configuration Manager there to set policy and compliance settings for the device, and also to push applications up to the cloud where they can be retrieved by the user through the company portal. So we have this distinction between registering the device and enrolling the device. You don't have to have both. Of course, if you've got both, it's the best of both worlds because you can authenticate the device and manage the device. Um, but there's no interdependency that we require both uh, in the environment there. So in terms of the enrollment, um, this was a slide that we used for Service Pack 1 of Configuration Manager. And I've just dropped a few new things on there uh, with the R2 release. Um, enrollment, as I mentioned, it's opting in for uh, management there. And it's a user-initiated process. We don't force people into enrollment. We don't pre-enroll them. Um, the user has to opt in to allow their device to be managed. Uh, and on the slide there, it calls out that we've got RT, Windows Phone 8, and iOS. Uh, as supported for direct management, and Android, of course, will be coming with the R2 release. So the main thing you get from the actual initial enrollment is the device is set up in the management system, and policy is going to be pushed down to it immediately. So let me take you through the enrollment experience, minding the creaky stage. Right. If I switch over to my devices, I have a very familiar looking iDevice here, which I want to enroll in my environment. I'm going to go and launch the browser on my device. And let's just drop the URL that I have in the clipboard here. So this could be my personal phone that I've acquired. I want to bring it into my company. But I'm going to have to opt in uh, for the management here. And it's going to prompt me to, to log in. I've actually already got my username saved in here. But I've got to enter my password into my device. So. I'm just going to drop you back to the logo slide while I enter my super secret password. I have been burnt before by leaving my password up on the screen. I will not do it this time. And you got the right password. I hope so. Let's go back to the phone. Try that again. Wakey, wakey. That's 
that's a really good question. Which credential are they using? Um, in an ideal scenario, um, in a corporate scenario, you would use your corporate email address and um, your corporate password. We use Active Directory Federation services to validate that password, so there's no synchronization of the password up to the cloud service or anything. Um, but the user can still use their corporate credentials there. Um, I'm not actually using my corporate email address because I don't have all that environment with ADFS set up uh, for my demos here, which is why it's a contoso.onmicrosoft.com address. So you're using an Azure Active Directory account? That's correct. Okay. Let me just see if I can switch between these machines. It's the screen's gone black, which is not good. Well, the worrying thing is I can't actually switch to any machine. Do we have an AV guy in the house that can perhaps help me here? Three. No, that one. This one, which is HDMI on there and HDMI on there. OK, while we're working on that, um, one thing I will mention is that um, I've gone through the website here to authenticate and do the management there. Um, with the R2 release, we're actually going to have a native application for iOS, which will enable you to go to the iTunes store and download our company portal app, and we'll do the enrollment through that. So a better experience for the end users by having a native application on the device uh, to get enrolled and get their corporate information there. And again, we'll have the similar thing for uh, the, the Google Android devices, a native application which the user can get from the Google Play Store and then do the enrollment through that. Do we have to wait until GA, or will that app be available after build for those of us that want to play with Sandbox? Okay, so the question was, will that be available after build with all the other previews, or are you going to have to wait? Um, there will be a preview build of Configuration Manager R2 that will release with all the other preview releases that are coming out. Unfortunately, the service side, the cloud services, there is not going to be a preview. Um, so you won't be able to play with the mobile device management piece. Yeah. You will be able to, because you'll have the preview of Configuration Manager, you will be able to look at the admin experience from that side of things and kind of play around with some of the new features from, from that side. Um, but yes. Excellent. This is a great time to take questions, seeing as I seem to have managed to break the AV system. Yeah. Windows Phone support. Windows Phone support. Um, we support Windows Phone 8 um, with direct management here. So um, we will talk directly to the OMIDM management agent on Windows Phone 8. Um, we've got uh, Craig's, hopefully if we get the slides back, Craig's going to go through um, the kinds of settings you can set there. We will actually support Windows Phone 7 as well via the Exchange Connector. So if you're setting up policy, um, it can go through to Exchange and set the policy there. So if somebody's syncing their Windows Phone 7 device with Exchange, uh, they'll get the policy through that. Yeah. And that's that support is available with SP1 today and with the current um, version that's running on the cloud service for Windows Engine. The self-service portal for the... Yep. So that's available as well today with the current release that we uh, upgraded the service to in December, January of this year. Yep. You really broke it, dude. I did. Now we've got nothing. <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's really safe. How are you at uh, hand puppets? The annoying thing is I do have some screenshots for some of the demos that we could flick over to, but the fact that I can't get anything can't get on the, the screen... can't get to the PowerPoint either now. That's, that's really not good. Oh, dear. Okay. Okay, video text coming in two minutes, apparently. Okay. So what were the, some of the topics that you had on your slides? Maybe we can cover some of them if you can remember them. Well, off top I, of your head. I was going to do the enrollment demo, show iOS and show uh, Windows RT enrollment, so you could get a bit of the Windows experience as well. Um, you will, of course, have seen the Windows um, 8.1 uh, enrollment experience that Molly 
demoed on the keynote. Uh, then I was going to hand over to you, Craig, to talk settings. Yeah, so there's a couple of things we we're going to talk about. Uh, device inventory, for example, we've added a new attribute uh, with, with regards to the system that is called device ownership. So you can actually define one of these mobile devices as either uh, corporate owned or personally owned. When these devices are originally are enrolled, they will come in as personally owned by default. But you can change them to corporately owned. The reason we wanted to do this is so that if these devices are actually owned by the corporation, you can do a deeper level of inventory on those devices. Uh, by default, when you do inventory on a personal device, on a mobile device, we'll only look at the applications that was deployed by the system itself, by, by Configuration Manager and Windows in Tune. Um, if you set it to corporate on some of the platforms, because this platform is specific, and we'll talk about that when we have AV again, um, you can actually inventory all of the applications that are on those devices. The other thing that it supports with this, uh, this attribute is when you go and create an app in the, in the application model, you're actually able to define a deployment type using this as a global condition. So you're able to say, you know, I want to install this application only on my corporately owned mobile devices, or I want to install this only on my personally owned corporate devices. Or you may have two different flavors of that application depending on the ownership of that device. Yep. Does that mean you can't blacklist a device based on something that's unknown? That one? For these person, yes. For these mobile devices, obviously, you can't do that. Yes. Right. They're still personally owned. They're still considered personally owned devices. So, um, but you know, blacklist and whitelist is definitely something that uh, we continue to to investigate as well. Though. So, um, I think. Oh, you got it back. Yeah, round of applause for the AV guys. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Go. Okay, back to my demo. It was password anyway, so. Shh. <laughs> okay. That's, he was really actually embarrassed about it. That's why he didn't want to show it. It wasn't that it was top secret. So this will log into uh, the Windows Intune service using my credentials there. Again, as I said, it would normally be your corporate email address and your corporate password. I'm just using a, uh, a cloud-based identity for this. It tells me my device is not actually known, so I'm going to add this device to my environment here and hit install to get my profile come down. This actually switches then over to the iOS experience for installing a management profile. As I mentioned, we do direct management, um, so the management itself is talking straight to Apple's APIs on the phone, so it's not our client experience that's doing the management, it's Apple's client that sits on there. So we go through Apple's management profile screens here, we say we want to install. There's a whole bunch of negotiation that happens with keys and certs and fancy stuff like that. And it'll tell us in a moment that the management profile is ready to be installed. We get a little warning saying, do you really want to allow your administrator to manage your device? And we do. We wait a little while longer. Do you want to answer that, Craig? Yeah, so if you're not using ADFS, but you are using DirSync, okay, those, those uh, user the, the user account itself will be uh, replicated through to the Windows Intune service. You'll then have to use the Intune account portal um, website and generate a specific, uh, a new password for each of those users that you um, are going to be managing on these, uh, allowing to enroll these devices. So, you, so they'll, have, they'll have the same account, but you'll have two passwords. One for essentially what you're doing. If you're not using ADFS, then essentially that account got replicated into Azure Active Directory. Um, so then they've got on your on-prem Active Directory, you've got your account and your password. You've got the same account in Azure Active Directory. Um, and then you'll just need to add, the, add a new password for it. Generating them initial passwords, you'll have to give them out of the No, you'll have to create passwords for them. Yep. And then you'll have to, yeah. Send them to them exactly. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's why we encourage. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you're going to be doing that for about three weeks and get really tired of it. And then you're going to start investigating deploying um, ADFS. Yes. Okay. So my iPhone here received the management profile. It's now installed on the device. Um, the device will now start its management session with the Intune service and pull down whatever policy is relevant to it, whatever's been assigned. Uh, 
to me as a user or to uh, this device. Uh, and I've got access to my company portal where I can go and get the apps that are assigned to me. I'm not going to go any further into the company portal. If you want to hear more, you'll have to come along to the app session later today. We won't do their demos. No, we won't okay. do their demos. Um, So the question was, does it also configure EAS? At this point, no, it doesn't. That would be a separate setup on, on the device. You're talking about the email profile on the? Yeah. We don't do that, that today. OK. So I've switched over to my RT device, and I didn't break the AV system this time. Um, so I'm going to show you the Windows 8 experience here. Molly showed the Windows 8.1 experience in uh, the keynote. So there's some subtle differences. On 8.1, we've built the enrollment into the modern control panel. Uh, but for Windows 8, we actually have a traditional classic control panel app. So if I search for company apps under settings, we've got this company apps control panel that will launch. And similar to uh, the iPhone, it's going to ask for my email address and password. Would help if I actually remembered what the email address was. You should remember which company you're working for, yes. It would be useful. It would, and if I could type as well. This one doesn't show clear text passwords. Yes, you do. There's an F. I do. Freudian slip with an F. An F? Yeah. F and a Contoso. That's what it's called. Oh, okay. My company is Contoso CF. Oh. Now, this one actually hasn't found the management server straight away. The reason is I don't have it set up as a fully corporate environment. If I was using a corporate email address, like at contoso.com, the device can actually go and automatically find the management point. Because um, you'll have a DNS record, a public DNS record. That's it. Because I'm not doing that and I don't have the redirection, it's a bit like Exchange Auto Discovery. Because I don't have that set up, I'm actually going to have to tell this manually to go and talk to the Intune services at manage.microsoft.com. So this will do the same kind of thing the iPhone did, where it will negotiate with the service. Uh, in this case, a certificate comes down. Uh, and then it will start the management session with the Intune service. So we'll see this pop up hopefully in a moment saying the uh, device is now enrolled for management. And it will give me a link to go and install the company app portal on this device as well. Uh, once more, I won't drill into that because the app session this afternoon will take you there. And you've seen some of the experience in R2 anyway in the keynote. So that was Windows 8 and iOS. I'm actually going to flick over to my but laptop. wait, there's more. Th there is more. I'm going to flick over to the laptop here. Oh, yeah, I didn't break it again. And I've got some screenshots. Unfortunately, we don't have um, working code that's in a healthy enough state to show you it live at this point. But I have the native applications for iOS and Android as uh, a click through here. So I can show you what the enrollment experience will be come the R2 release. So here's a, an iPad uh, application. The user downloads this from the iTunes store. They get the option to log in. Again, the same kind of login prompt that we've seen on the other devices. And then once they're into that, then they've been uh, authenticated, they'll get into the main portal here, and it will show them that they've got a new device here. But the device isn't actually registered yet, enrolled yet. So I'll go and select this device and say I'm actually going to want to enroll it. And it will go through a process of adding the device. And again, this is an iPad, so we're using the Apple built-in management client. So it will go through the same management profile process. And we're then back to the company portal, and we can see that our device is now there, and it's enrolled. Yeah, question? That's a really good question. What happens in, in the admin experience when you get all these devices in there, and they've all got exactly the same name? Um, one of the great things is the fact that we link the device to a user. So part of the enrollment takes the user account and associates it with the device when it enrolls. So when you look at the devices in the console, and Craig can show you this uh, shortly, you can actually go and see users and which devices they've got. So if you need to go and find Craig's device, you look for him, and you can see the devices you've got there. Um, there is also the capability to rename the device from within the self-service portal as well. So with 
these, um, the self-service portal applications, we're actually doing native management ourselves, so it doesn't, you don't necessarily need EAS to do that management. Right, so we're talking natively to it from our service, and vice versa. I'm gonna switch over to another PowerPoint presentation I have that will just walk us through the uh, Android experience. Here we've got a, a, an Android device that's already got the company portal app installed on it from Google Play. And again, same kind of experience. It tells us we're gonna need to sign in. We go and sign in as our user. Um, on Android, there's gonna be a prompt saying, hey, there's a bunch of stuff gonna happen to your device if you do this. And we say, yes, we're gonna do that. Um, Windows Intune itself actually prompts the user and says, hey, we're gonna manage this device. And then the device is added and the user has access to their company portal there. So that was kind of the, a brief show and tell of, of the experience that is coming in the R2 wave. So let me flick back to... Yeah, so what you'll notice with the Android and the iOS and, and obviously with the, the new uh, versions of the self-service portal apps for the Windows devices is there's some degree of consistency across the devices as far as, as, far as the experience, but we've also tried to tie in um, the design intents of those platforms as well. So there's a little bit of commonality, but they're also tailored towards the platforms themselves. And then just the final thing I wanted to mention on device enrollment is the troubleshooting question. Um, I've dropped this slide in here because we did have some feedback from our TAP customers and the early adopters that um, we really need to let people know the best way to approach this because um, it's very easy for somebody with a device to go, hey, I want to enroll, how do I do this? They see the enrollment option in the control panel or they see the company portal app in the store and they go and download it and, and try and enroll um, and, and fall over. So we just put together a list of here are the first things to look at if you're actually having trouble enrolling your device. So has the environment actually been set up for mobile device management in the first place? Are those device types enabled for management? Um, do you have things like the right code signing certificates and capabilities like that set up properly there? Um, so this will be in the slide deck that you'll be able to download later, but these are just kind of the first hints we go through um, if we need to troubleshoot enrollment. So I'll hand over to oh, Craig now. Handing over to me. You get the clicker. I wonder why it would change slide on me like that. Um, so what I was gonna say is just on that other, the previous slide, a lot of this information was provided yesterday, in yesterday's session on setup and configuration of Windows and Tune and Configuration Manager and setting up the unified device management. Um, probably the most common ones is not getting the user synchronized correctly and there's, hopefully they went into a whole lot of detail on how to do that. There's also a blog available on how to set it up um, available as well. Okay, so we talked a little bit already while we had AV issues about device inventory so we can set so we have this attribute called, called device ownership. We can set it to personal or corporate. Um, it inventories differently. If it's set to personal, it only inventories the ab applications we deployed down to the device. If it's set to corporate, it'll do a full inventory of the applications on the device. Note the asterisks here that Apple um, only supports inventory of MDM provisioned applications. So regardless of whether you set it to corporate or personal, it's only going to do the ones that are actually provisioned by the service. And then the other thing is we have a new global condition that allows you to deploy different deployment types based on this attribute as well. So with that said, I will switch over to the admin console, which has been nicely provisioned for me. Excellent. All right, so we're in here. We're looking at all of the systems. And one of the things we wanted to make sure we were doing is that all of these devices, these mobile devices you've seen today, they're just another device. So they're, they're just like a PC, they're just like a desktop, they're just like a Linux box, they're, they're just like a Mac, right? They're just devices to us. Um, one thing you will notice, I did add this optional column, which is device ownership or owner. And you can see that most of these have been set to personal. So when they first registered, they automatically become personal. When you enroll the PCs uh, in your corporate environment, they will automatically be set to company. And what you can do though, however, is if you go to one of these machines, you're actually able to change ownership. So at the moment, it's, default, it's set to personal. I'm able to easily change this to corporate or to company. And then that has now been changed to company. So it's as simple as that. Um, it's very similar to the way you manage uh, user device affinity. Um, and it allows you to, to then use that as a global condition for, for software distribution. 
Again, they're just another device, so let's take a look at some uh, inventory. And I'm trying to remember the one that we had that had a whole bunch of inventory on it. Do you remember? That, uh, the, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. So there's no, for, there's no changing of the policy on the device itself. It only does those two functions. So it's not, and the reason we, we haven't changed anything on the, on the client is because we're not really being intrusive to the user and the user experience. Um, as we move forward, as things change, we may end up setting that value on those devices as we may want to start doing some different sets of policy management, potentially on those devices. We'll probably need to have the IT administrator have a conversation with, with the user through the system to say, hey, you know, we've, we've marked this device as a corporate device, um, and we're going to be managing, we're going to be locking that down, making it a, lo you know, a lot more restrictive on what you're able to do. But at the moment, for this release, we're just looking at doing a uh, greater level of inventory and being able to target applications a little, bit, a little bit differently depending on that ownership model. But obviously, you can kind of see where we're going. We just haven't. There's some, there's, there's some education that needs to happen and some considerations to what does it mean when if I can then change policy configuration based on that ownership model, what is the conversation I need to have with the end user? Unless you've set this as, a, as an administrator to, to the company, yep, yep. Um, so again, we can look at the hardware inventory of these devices. I mean, it's, it's hardware inventory, it, you know, it kind of is what it is. It tells you the system, tells you memory, tells you et cetera. Well, that's one of our key things is it is just inventory. So where you're used to doing PC inventory and reporting off what your PCs have out there, both hardware and software, we've got the consistent experience there for the mobile devices too. Um, and the, I think that was all I was going to do on this one. Yep. That's right, I'm just thinking aloud. I was hoping you would prompt me if I forgot something. You're good so far. Okay. All right. So that was, that was a quick, quick demo. We have some more interesting ones later. Um, so let's get on to settings management. Okay. So the settings are actually applied to the devices both through the Windows Intune service when it's connected to Configuration Manager as well as through your Exchange Server Connector. So when you create that policy, we actually push, if you've configured uh, Configuration Manager to connect to your Exchange environment, either on-prem or um, online, um, we will actually push that policy through both of those channels, both through the Windows Intune service and through the Exchange connector. That way, they'll get one set of policy. Um, now, if they do get conflicting ones, because your Exchange administrator may actually configure a different, different policy, the most restrictive is, is actually going to win. So if you have a password, through Exchange that says set it to four characters, you have one through Configuration Manager that says set it to six, it'll be set to six. Um, we've uh, created a, secure, a single security policy template, so it's, we have like a basic experience where we kind of lay out all the types of categories of settings, and you can go through and set some, some uh, attributes associated with those particular categories. Um, and then we also have an advanced function where we actually give you a full list of all of the uh, settings we're able to manage on these mobile devices, as well as which platforms they're applicable to. And so you can actually see, when I show you the demo, all of those settings, what platforms they're applicable to, and what, uh, which ones they're not going to actually uh, be applicable to. Reporting. Again, they're just another set of devices, so we can use the in-console monitoring to determine compliance with these settings. Um, as well as uh, non-compliance and re any remediation that needs to be done uh, that's applicable to these, to these settings. So here's kind of how we, we broke up the various categories of settings, and I'll, I can show you the full list. When you get the, the preview that'll come out at the end of the month, you'll be able to install your configuration manager, um, you know, st single standalone primary site. You'll be able to look at all of these settings and see all the settings that are available and which platforms are applicable to. But, one of the, the big things we've done with, with uh, the R2 release is we've had support now for VPN, Wi-Fi, and certificate management. So we're actually able to, to provision those uh, certificates and those configurations profiles down to these mobile devices. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the even cooler things that are associated with the VPN configurations as well. Uh, password support, obviously, um, kind of a no-brainer. 
Uh, we have some degree of device restrictions as well as far as what they can do, like cameras and things like that. Uh, uh, store access, uh, we can do that for iOS so we can actually prevent any, the user from connecting to the store. Um, now, when we do software distribution, we can actually distribute applications that are contained within the store. So you may want to think about whether you actually want to do that um, or not. Um, something to think about. We have some degree of um, settings you're able to manage with the browsers. We can do the contents rating for iOS. Uh, Cloud Sync, we can manage both the, the uh, 8.1 uh, PC and RT devices as well as the iOS devices. Encryption, security, um, roaming. Again, basically what it comes down to is depending on the platform support as determines whether for that particular setting we can actually um, configure those options. And then last but not least, of course, you've seen the demos at least once, if not a couple of times, on work folders, and you're actually able to configure those settings um, through, through Configuration Manager, um, just as you would through, through GP, as Ian said. Okay. So, resource access configuration. So this is what I was talking about. You can actually deploy the, the VPN profiles um, and the Wi-Fi and authentication settings down to these devices. Um, the other thing you can do is for Windows 8.1, we have automatic VPN uh, Wi-Fi protocol, which means we can actually, if an application is, is started on that device and it needs, and it need, has a reference to the corporate uh, DNS information, is that you banging? No. That's me, okay. Or it's a ghost in the machine. Could be a ghost in the machine. Anyway. So if you have an application that needs access to the corporate network, it'll automatically fire up that VPN connection so the user doesn't have to necessarily go to your VPN, connect to your VPN, and then come back to the application. It'll actually fully integrate it into that application. It'll automatically, in the background, connect through your VPN settings that you've provisioned down to that device. Okay, platforms we support, uh, 8.1, uh, both PC and, and RT, as well as iOS and Android. You might want to take photos of this if you're taking photos of, of various screens. You can see that as far as VPN profiles, we're not just supporting the Microsoft VPN uh, stack, but we're also supporting a large number of the major SSL vendors as well. Okay. So hopefully you're, a bunch of you are happy about that. Um, as well as the, the, the standard um, configurations that we have as well. The last one is what I was talking about. If you have DNS name-based uh, name uh, initiation support, both for 8.1 as well as uh, iOS applications, it'll automatically make a VPN connection for that application without necessarily having the user flip back and forward between um, connecting through VPN. It is me banging. Hmm. Wi-Fi and certificate profiles. Again, we can, we can provision these, these configurations. You can also set up, for example, whether they should be using proxy servers, what those configuration of those proxy servers are. Uh, we can also deploy you know, root certificates, and, and uh, we support SCIP as well, as far as a protocol for those certificates. Anything you wanted to add on that, Martin? I don't think so. I think you need to show the guys this oh. on the console. I'm about to. I've got one more slide, and I'll oh. get there. Well, hopefully, I've got one more slide. Yes. All right, so work folders, you've seen the, the demonstrations on that. We won't necessarily go into too much detail on that, just to let you know that we actually can configure them through our settings management system, just as you would through, through GP. All right, now I can demo. Okay, so let's switch to over to our configuration items. And you see I don't have any created at the moment, so I will go ahead and create one of these. And of course, we'll use the standard test. Um, but in this case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a set a configuration item for mobile devices. And here you can see it's given me those categories. So I can see I've got those high-level categories we talked about. You've got password, device, email management, store, et cetera. Um, but also down here, we have configure additional settings that are not in the default settings groups. So these are, these are, this will give you a full list of all the settings that are available within the system. So there was a couple we wanted to look at here. Um, we probably should look at the work folders, and we will also look at the cloud. And we'll also set, check the long list. So with the cloud, obviously, you can do a bunch of settings here. One of the things we can do is actually setting synchronization over metered connections. So if it's using a metered connection, we can be very um, vigilant about how we uh, synchronize uh, that. We can actually prevent 
for that synchronization from occurring using the prohibit. Work folders, this is where you would put in a, a contoso.com URL, and you can say that we would automatically force that. That way they can, when I deploy this to my customers or to my end users, they're going to get this configuration. They're going to automatically have access to that work folder URL and be able to, to start looking at their documents. And then we have the full list of all of the settings that we have available within the product. Okay, so there's a very long list. You can see here that we have the supported platforms for each one of these. You can see that there's a bunch of them associated with just the iOS de devices. There's a series that are associated with your mobile devices, um, associated only with 8.1 devices. Okay, so as you can see, there's a fairly long list. Was there any ones that we wanted to pull out here specifically, Martin, do you remember? Um, you could just pick one at random. Um, why not stick the video conferencing one for iOS on there? Video conference. Just oh, above. One above. There we go. Okay, so like that one. Okay, so this makes complete. So video conferencing is equals true, and so if you flick that over to false. That would uh, disable FaceTime for those users on iOS if that was something you didn't want on your corporate devices. Okay. And then you can uh, remediate non-compliant rules. So if it detects that it's not set to that value, it's going to automatically remediate it back to that value. And you can also determine what level of reporting you want to have for this particular non-compliance. You could say that if, you're if you have devices that are um, non-compliant with this, you may just send it back as an informational message or you may actually want to set it as a warning critical or even with an event so you can actually be alerted if anybody's configuring. Say, for example, you're in a manufacturing company and you've set it so that none of the mobile devices are allowed to have a camera. You could set it to an alert when any, anyone violates that. You'd then be able to um, remind them that you're producing top secret products and it's probably not good for their career to continue to, take, to bring a phone with a camera enabled on it. Just an idea. Okay. So we will, can oh, the other thing is, oh, yeah, we wanted to show the supported platforms. You can choose which platforms you want to support. And then the other thing is, it'll show you at the end, before you actually commit to creating this configuration item, it'll actually tell you any of the platforms that are unsupported. So if you're going through and you're setting a whole bunch of those settings, when you get to this page, it'll actually tell you, well, this is not going to apply to these platforms as well. So we give you best of both worlds. We tell you which platforms it does apply to when you're actually selecting the settings, and then we tell you which, which um, platforms it doesn't apply to um, once you've selected those settings. Yeah, and one of the key points there, of course, is that you can create a policy. It doesn't have to be specific to the device platform. You could throw whatever settings you have for your corporate requirement in there, and the appropriate settings will be applied to the device depending on what platform connects through. Um, but you want some level of reporting back about what your policy set's going to do. So this tells you, okay, you've created your corporate policy here. Let's say it's an R&D policy. If R&D guys have these devices, they're not actually going to have that policy setting applied. So um, you've got that reporting there, but it means you don't have to do specific, here's my iPhone settings, here's my Windows phone settings, here's my 8.1 settings. Yep, and you can export this report as well, so you can actually check it, obviously, in a slightly different format to that. The other thing is you can obviously add this configuration item to a baseline. So you could set a baseline for a particular set of users. You could have a PC configuration item so that it would actually configure their PCs. This one would configure their mobile devices. You target the user. They're going to end up getting those, those configuration items applied to them regardless of which machine they're on. Okay? When you set this, even if you were to set these and you know that there's unsupported platforms, if the user actually connects and, and starts getting this policy for an unsupported platform, they will come back through anyway as um, a non um, not applicable to those platforms as well anyway. So it's kind of a, an additional level of, of monitoring that you have by setting these values. It's not just a fire and forget. The other thing we wanted to show you is we've done a little bit more work as far as the experience you will have when you're provisioning uh, VPN profiles. Um, and Wi-Fi and certificate profile. So I see you've got one already created here, but let me go through the experience of creating a new one. 
or use test again because we do. You can also import using uh, from a file. Uh, so if you already have um, a different vendor that has uh, a file that's able to be imported, you could use that option. Or you can manually go ahead and set it. Again, you can see all the, the third party or the external Microsoft uh, partners that um, have, do have VPN products. You can select to use any one of those. So it's not just Microsoft. Um, go ahead and set the rest of your information that you would not typically do for, um, for a VPN connection. So I'm going to cancel out of there and show you one that we've already baked, so to speak. Um, so you define your connection. You can define your authentication method, proxy settings. So we could set specific pro proxy settings to tell, you, tell these devices which uh, um, proxy they should be hitting. Automatic VPN. So this is when we're talking about if you have an application that's enabled to do automatic VPN. So if that application, when it's running on that device, automatically made a call to uh, the DNS suffix uh, corp.contoso.com, it would automatically use this particular profile to make a VPN connection to your company. Okay. The other thing I'll throw in there is um, there are two types of uh, automatic VPN connections in Windows 8.1. Uh, we have the DNS triggered, as Craig, de Craig described there, going to a specific DNS suffix. The other one is app triggered. Um, if you go along to the app session later this afternoon, hopefully they'll show you how you can set that up. So if somebody launches a specific app, like the remote desktop connection, it can force the, the VPN to come up appropriately there as well. I could show it. Are you going to show it? I could show it. You're stealing the thunder from the app session if you do that. They might not be but happy. But it's my app model. Do it, do it. I'll do it. I built half of the app model. I'm allowed to do it. I'm telling. You're telling. <laughs> I've got to remember how to get there now. <laughs> uh, where did we? Oh, it was on the deployment type. It was on the point? It was on the. Oh, that's a good point. We should actually find an app that has a mobile device deployment type. Did you create one? Let's see if this one has it. And Can you remember where it is? That's the that question. might be a question. Good question. I found it the other day. Oh, I can't find it now. I, I found it. There's a, there's a, there's a checkbox in there that allows you to do it. Okay, so I failed. <laughs> That's what happens when you go off script. <laughs> but you can actually do it when you're creating the app. You can actually define that it, it should use a, the uh, auto VPN con connection when it's uh, connecting. Wi-Fi settings. So we can set up Wi-Fi settings as well. So we'll use test again, because I can type test, but not much else. OK, you can give it the, the, the network name you want to connect to, the SSID. Um, there's a bunch of other settings you can set there, as well as um, things like the advanced settings, as well as proxy platforms. I won't go through that, but we can, as you can see, we've got multiple Wi-Fi settings. So for an, in our case, we have one for corporation. We also have one for R&D, because we don't trust those, those R&D guys, or Martin doesn't trust those R&D guys. We like to keep them isolated on their own network. It's safer. Right. Um, so again, this authentication method you're going to be using, uh, some of the advanced settings on how it's going to be authenticated, whether it's going to use single sign-on, for example. Again, proxy settings for this Wi-Fi connection and then support a platform. So you actually could configure different Wi-Fi's depending on the platforms you want to you enable and want to support on your Wi-Fi networks. Okay, so that was settings in a nutshell. I would encourage you to, to get hold of the preview when it comes out at the end of this month, um, and, and feel free to take a look at all of those settings there and, and see if they meet your needs. Oh, I need to switch back to here. And I will hand off you to drive us home. Thank you very much, Craig. OK, so the final leg of this journey is the corporate data protection side. Um, we have two concepts when we look at protecting data on the devices. Um, if apps are going down to the device and corporate data is going to live on the device, there's, there's these two possible scenarios. One, the device is no longer around, or the person's no longer around, and you need to get everything off that device, so uh, we're going to wipe it. Um, that's pretty destructive, because on a lot of platforms, it does a complete factory reset. The other side is retiring the device. 
So if somebody leaves the company and you want to remove your corporate data as they walk out the door, you want to pull that back but not blow away their entire device. Or similarly, if somebody has a device and they've decided, hey, that tablet was all well and good, but I'm going to get one of these brand new Surface RTs, so I'm going to pass this device off to my kids to play with, they probably want their corporate data removing from it as well. It does vary by platform what we can actually do. Um, unfortunately, on the management server side, we're limited by what's actually in the platforms. Um, but we do try and take advantage of whatever APIs and capabilities they give us. And you can see some of the details there. Um, one of the key things I like to point out is these actions can both be user and admin initiated. So if an admin needs to go and wipe a device or retire a device, they can. If the user wants to do it themselves, they can as well. Um, I ought to mention, kind of down on the bottom, it mentions um, removes enterprise certs um, uh, and email when you retire a device. That's a new capability that we have with Windows 8.1 with uh, things like work folders, where the corporate data that's being synchronized down is actually encrypted as it comes down and sits within, uh, effectively, an encrypted store on the device. Uh, we remove the encryption key when we retire the device, rendering that store completely useless. So there's no recovery of that information at all. Um, selective wipe, I mentioned kind of, uh, it varies depending on the platform, but the key thing that we try and get at all the platforms is the list that's there. So removing uh, the mailbox if we can, removing policies that have been applied, any profiles, the VPN and Wi-Fi stuff that uh, Craig mentioned, and then the corporate app data as well. And a uh, table here for reference that just kind of shows the capabilities across uh, full wipe and selective wipe and what is done on, on which particular platform there. And this is kind of a handy reference to have. Uh, so when the slides are published up on Channel 9, uh, you can grab that and drill into that a little bit further there. So let me just show you some of that capability on the devices. If I switch over to my RT device here. Um, I actually installed the company portal while Craig was doing his piece. So you can see uh, my Contoso company portal app here. Uh, and you can see the list of devices that we've got over here. Uh, my account happens to have these four devices enrolled here. If I go and select the iPhone, we can see a few details about the iPhone here. And then down this bottom right-hand corner, we've got the three options, wipe, remove, and rename. Rename's the option where I could actually go in as a user and say, hey, I don't want it just be called iPhone. I'm going to call it Martin's iPhone. Uh, and I can manually rename it there. Uh, remove is the option for me to remove the device from management. So if I'm giving um, this iPhone to one of my kids to play with, I can go and remove it from my tablet and actually get the data removed there. I'm going to go and hit wipe. And it's going to tell me, do I really, really want to do it? We'll hit OK. So this console will communicate with the Intune cloud services, let it know uh, that we want to wipe the device. And if I just flick straight over to HDMI, this happened quicker than I expected. And you had to. It's really quick. Oh. Now, this could be that we're not getting HDMI out because it is already wiping. It's actually back to the Apple boot screen already. Um, often with these things, with network latencies and services in the cloud, there's a delay potentially of a few minutes. So I was expecting to be able to turn over to the device and um, show you it reboot itself, but it's quite happily done it quicker than I could talk. So that was the wipe initiated from my tablet um, down to my iOS device there. No, we did it on it was the device. That was us. That was us this time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to panic the AV guys. So in the console here, you can see it's removed the iPhone from my list of managed devices. Um, so it's gone, and we'll hopefully reboot nice and clean there. Um, the other thing I can do in the console, in the self-service portal here, is uh, if I go into my Surface device, I can actually go and hit Remove, OK, and that will remove my device from management itself. So any corporate information that was in work folders on if this was Windows 8.1 uh, Surface, would have been removed. Um, any apps, line of business apps that have been installed um, on the device would be removed as well. Any store apps that have been installed, like the company portal itself, or um, if they've installed something like Skype through uh, the company portal but pulling it from the Windows store, that would actually remain on the device as well because it's a store app, not a line of business app that we've pushed. Um, you'll hear more about that in the app session later on. Um, but you can see the little thing down here that says this device is no longer enrolled. So policies removed from it. It's no longer going to communicate with the management service unless I re-enroll it there. So I'm going to flick over to Craig's demo machine here and just show you what the IT Pro side of the experience looks like. If I go into my devices collections and look at my mobile devices here, 
if I go and pick uh, Paul's iPad, I've got the... He's not, he's not your boss, is he? He's not my boss, no. no he's my boss. You can do it there. <laughs> I can wipe his iPad, can I? Thank you. So I've got the option here to... Um, I need my camera. Video. <laughs> I've got the option here to go and initiate the wipe remotely on Paul's device here. So if that device has been lost, you can have your help desk have access to the console and do that wipe if necessary, um, if your users don't have the uh, support there. Um, I don't actually have a phone in here. I was going to show you a phone one. What's a Deep's device? Yeah, so this one... Um, this is a device where we can't actually do a full factory reset on it, so it just says wipe the company content and retire the mobile device. So we're not going to do the full wipe on it, we're going to do the selective wipe, so I don't get the other option there. I won't actually do it, because Adeep might not like me if I do and, that. And he worked on putting together the keynote. He's he, one of our developers, so we may not want to wipe his stuff. He was one of the rock stars behind the keynote. <laughs> he uh, was a man behind the curtain. Keynote's so. <laughs> over, Finally, just to kind of round off the demo, if I switch over to my iPhone, turn the screen back on. Do you want to take that question while I just work out why we've got a funny color? We're, we're looking at, uh, well, we're, we're looking at, at working on that at the moment. I don't think we've committed to, to delivering that, but it is, some, it is a feature that we are looking at uh, what we can do. Uh, we can, uh, can we do the, do the detection for jailbroken devices? Okay, I'm not sure why I've managed to turn the screen a funny color now, but you can see my iPhone's way back at the uh, select your language uh, start option there. And it's pink. It's, uh, I am having a disaster with the AV today. Excellent. Okay, so just to kind of round off, we're doing good on time, we've got time for questions. So um, just to kind of recap where we're at, the table here... I really wanted to drop this in the presentation to highlight, again, the difference between the workplace join registering of a device and the enrolling for management using Intune and Configuration Manager. Um, if you want to register your device, you can do certain things, like getting access to resources based on the security principle of the device. Um, but getting the device MDM enrolled, the mobile device management enrollment, gives you so much more capability with the device. Uh, and then if you're looking at fully managed, so the traditional PC management, uh, in Configuration Manager, that's where you get uh, the bucket list of everything you can do uh, to deep yep. manage the device. So when you're looking at a PC, you know, like a Windows 8.1 PC, for example, you could compare those two, two right-hand columns. Right-hand columns. Um, so you could potentially just manage a device using um, the OMDM agent on a Windows 8.1 PC, and you would get that third column. If you, in if you install the full uh, Configuration Manager agent, you'll get everything that's on the right-hand column. Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, the idea of doing the MDM management on Windows 8.1 laptops themselves is great for the bring-your-own-device scenarios where somebody's walking in with their personal laptop and you want to have a level of management, but you can't do the full configuration manager deep management. Yeah? A couple of slides back, I saw two, two slides seemed to have our, uh, our contradict each other. It was about uh, Android device management. One slide said you can only remove the mailbox, and then the next slide showed That one? Yes. So the first slide talked about what we... Go forward one. Yeah. No, it's, nah. yeah, there no, we go. There. Yes, that, that's if you initiate a full wipe on Android, it will do an Exchange Active Sync wipe, which would just remove the Exchange Active Sync mailbox, because that's the way Android supports the Exchange Active Sync wipe command there. Um, the detail we have in here is the R2 management, so the client we have on the device. Um, so that does direct management there. Yeah, That's so a good for catch. SP1, we ought to, you can uh, do just the EAS based wipe for, for R2 with the full agent. If you installed the full agent onto that device, you'd be able to do this additional wipe capability. Yeah, I ought to have had on there full and selective wipe in R2. So. Why is the email test? Sorry. That's a really good point. I didn't edit the slide well enough, thank you. <laughs> it will be if you download it later today. 
I would just round off by going through the traditional ending slides. Um, there was a whole bunch of sessions that have happened earlier this week around device management. There's a couple more left to go. Um, so do check them out on channel nine or, or get to those breakouts if you can. Um, track resources, I'm sure you've seen this many times. More resources. You can win stuff. Um, there's a few links here that will take you to key pages, like the Configuration Manager page and the Intune page. And as we go live with the preview of Configuration Manager, there'll be some documentation appearing uh, up on those pages around those capabilities as well. So I think that was it. Yes, please do your evaluations and let us know what you thought of it, including the, the AV difficulties. No, we're not responsible for the AV difficulties. Please don't ding us for that. But uh, yeah, the, the evals are very useful to us. Yeah. That's actually a really good question. It's something I should have mentioned. The question was, um, if we want to get started with Intune now, what can we do before the R2 release? Um, Intune itself, you can use today with Service Pack 1 for Configuration Manager 2012. Um, so you can test out the experience as it stands today. Um, we actually have the ability for you to go to, um, if you go to windowsintune.com, you can sign up for a free 30-day trial of the cloud service. You could just use that with the web console and, and try that as the, the cloud standalone service. Or you could actually get, um, we have an eval VHD of Configuration Manager SP1. You can actually download that, run it as a virtual machine, and hook it up to your trial Intune account. So you can get the full experience of testing out Configuration Manager and Intune. Then when it comes to R2, um, and when we have the service live for you guys to try, you can just switch over uh, to use that. Um, people who are on Intune today will get migrated onto the new Intune service uh, when it comes later this year. Yeah. Okay. So if you already have Configuration Manager, I would suggest you know, upgrading to SP1 or, or putting it in the lab, whatever you want to do to, to, to check it out. Um, and then when we up, you'll upgrade to R2, and then um, we'll upgrade the service um, shortly after that. So that's kind of how the, the roadmap would go. If you haven't already got it, obviously, um, you could uh, wait till, till RTM for R2. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you, if you are an SCCM shop, but today you, you haven't fully switched over to CM2012, and you've got hundreds or thousands of devices running active today, what, what do you see as the, either the roadmap or the deployment strategy for migrating away from active sync and getting over to config manager for into? Do you want to me to handle this one? No, no, you don't want, so, so you can actually, Configuration Manager, you can integrate it with, you can use the Exchange Connector to do Active Sync. So they can continue to using Active Sync. One of the good things about still having the Active Sync connector and, and setting that up between Configuration Manager and Exchange is it's almost like this, doing discovery on all these devices. You actually find out which devices are actually connecting to your corporate network to use email. So we often recommend that you continue to deploy Config Manager set up the Exchange Connector so that you get the active sync, you get all those information about all the devices that are connecting to your environment, then deploy this, this unified device management solution, and then get them to get that higher level. And some of those devices, you may just want to continue to have them just having active sync and, and Exchange. And we can still push down policy that you're generating from Configuration Manager through that channel. If you have a set, a set of users that want to have that next level of, of management capability, they want to be able to install applications that you're you know, illustrating or making available to them, um, you can then have them enroll into um, a more of a, an MDM type solution. Right? So I would say they go hand in hand with what you've already got, which is you've already got Exchange Active Sync Connector. This is kind of that next level of management on, on those devices. So you don't have to get rid of that to go to this. Does that make sense? But over time, you probably would, so that you're not having to do dual management, or might No, because you can do the management from Configuration Manager. When you set up those settings, yeah. if any of those settings are also applicable by pushing them out through the Exchange Active Sync, we'll push them out through both channels, both through our native management capabilities and through Active Sync. So they'll get that policy both ways. Okay. So, uh, and the other thing is, as more devices come online, I mean, ActiveSync does a really good job of doing discovery of these devices. So I would keep it on. I wouldn't try even phase it out. I would keep it on. Mm. And there are scenarios where customers 
um, in your environments, you may want to allow people to connect via Exchange Active Sync and get policy for email access, but they're not going to do anything else with line of business apps. So you don't need to ask them to enroll. You could still just do the Exchange policy, but you're managing it in the same place that you're managing everything else. That's the key thing there. Okay. Other questions? It depends. So if you're using ADFS, um, and while they obviously look, they will log on to any, um, they'll probably have to enter their password at least once each time. Now, if they're using ADFS, it's, it's kind of like a single sign-on. So if they've logged on to use another application and connecting via a VPN, they've essentially already entered the domain credentials. So when they went to use the, the self-service portal or the company app, um, they wouldn't have to enter that password again. If you're not using ADFS, um, then you may, they may have to, every time they go into the company application, uh, the company app, enter their password in. So mm -hmm. the other tricky part is they have two passwords in. So that's why we encourage everybody to use ADFS, because then it's just their domain password, whether they're on this device or they're on a PC. So, so in, a, in an environment where the users don't actually know their account passwords, uh, because it's smart carded? Okay. Maybe they're candidates for just doing EAS manage base management. Maybe they're not ready to, to have additional capabilities about installing applications on their device, line of business applications on their device. I mean, That's going backwards. yeah, well, yeah. We moved beyond them having a password. Mm -hmm. You had another question. I mean, yeah. At some point, I mean, these devices obviously are getting smarter and smarter. At some point, they will have smart card capabilities as well. All right, so um, we'll continue to, to work with the various platforms to provide that functionality, but they're, they're not quite there yet. Yeah, question over there. Um, that, that's actually a really good question. The question was, how can I get more detailed reporting, things like the IMEI number, the serial number? Um, well, just for comparison, back to our, our, our uh, wireless Sure, sure. So for reporting and... Um, uh, yes, I mean, the simple answer is all the inventory information that we collect from the devices goes into the SQL database that sits underneath Configuration Manager. It's the same database that all the PC inventory information goes into. Um, so then... If you want to pull any of that information out, you can just use SQL reporting services to create a custom report, or we have some, I think there's about 400 reports out of the box now um, with SQL reporting services. So uh, you can take that and do that kind of reporting back off yeah, the any one, of the pieces of information. The one I'm not sure about is phone number, because that gets into a tricky F Phone number I know is, is explicitly not collected because of privacy requirements. We're not actually allowed to collect that one, but we do pull back the IMEI number and I think we have the I IMSI number as well, I believe. Um, but and I'm kind of on that point, I, would, I will point out that even the compliance information, so whether a device is meeting policy, um, all that information goes back into the database as well. And we have a number of customers that have looked at the idea of taking that information, using SQL reporting services to build charts of how many devices are compliant, kind of like your, your traffic light charts, and then just having SQL reporting services publish that to a SharePoint site. So you've always got an up-to-date dashboard of how compliant your estate is across PCs and mobile devices. So it's some uh, pretty flexible stuff you can do there. Mm -hmm. 
There's a lot of similarity between the two of them, and I think if it wasn't done in SP1, I think there's a lot of similarity now between with, with R2 and the, the future release of, of Intune in that space. Um, there's actually, I think, I, think I, I think I'm fair to say it's pretty much parity. I'm just... Let's, let's pull the settings up while we're here. Oh, do you have it set up? Yeah, we've got it configured. So if I go into our Intune subscription here, pull up the properties, um, you've got the ability to specify the company name, the URL, um, company contact information, so your IT department stuff. That's and not my real phone number, good. And the, and the logo. And your company logo uh, can go there. That's actually the Microsoft switchboard number, strangely enough. There you go. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we've got pretty much parity with what you could do with Intune um, coming in R2 now. Okay. Okay, we're... Right on time, finishing, so um, thank you all for uh, putting up with the AV issues, and thank you for listening to our presentation, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks. Thank you.